Hello and welcome to an episode of Historically Marked. I am Jason and I am in Bella Fountain Cemetery and yes, I am back and yes, I did a previous episode on this three years ago and I thought, well, this cemetery is so huge, there's so many notable burials here, I think it's time to do a part two. So part two it is, I'm going to show you at least 25 notable or, inter or interesting memorials. Hello. Now, I did show you plenty of um, famous interments in my previous video. I showed you at least probably 10 or a dozen, like I showed you the Beer Barons, and I showed you um, like the founder of Monsanto, and William Clark, and all them, but there are so many more to be unearthed here. I mean, everybody here has uh, interesting history, be it ancestry or whatnot, but according to findagrave.com, there are over 87,000 burials here in this vast cemetery. And under the famous interment section, there's over 300 names. And as one of my favorite cemetery YouTubers once pointed out, he actually once did an episode here. He said it would take the average person or history hunter more than a week to explore this cemetery because, again, I mean, it's really big. I mean, a lot of like military, war veterans, politicians, you name it. And Instead of calling them famous, I like to call them more like notable, more interesting because the, these, the following graves I'm about to show you, at least five of them are not in the quote unquote famous um, interment section on finding a grave. So hopefully you'll find them interesting as, as much as I do. And I mean, I don't like to call them A or B listers because you know, nobody's better than anyone, even though some history books, there were some certain people we studied in grade school, like William Clark, along with Lewis, he helped shape America. I mean, the Bush family and the Anheuser family, their name is still relevant in the beer industry. But there's been a lot of people whose successes at one time came to an end. But there are dozens of people whose forgotten names have been relegated to history books. And these people include 25 beer barons, 22 steamboat captains, 15 Civil War soldiers, 12 US congressmen, 12 people who once served as mayors of St. Louis, nine Missouri governors, and one madam. She's going to be one of the first ones I show you. And since the last time I did this video, there was a controversial figure who was, um, who was buried here two years ago. And I'm going to save that person for last. You probably know who it is because when I said the word controversial. So let's get on with the tour. And one thing not to forget is... Yes, there are different tours that the cemetery recommends doing. It's in this mailbox right here. Like you can do the historic loop trail. There's also the white line trail. Um, you'll know what I'm talking about when you watch this video, but they've selected some notable figures who are interred here. They, rec they encourage people to visit their um, burial sites. But all right, now we can start the tour for real. All right, first up is Tom Allen. He was a professional boxer born in Birmingham, England. He holds the distinction of being the first international bare knuckle heavyweight boxing champion in the world. Standing at 5 feet 11 inches, he began fighting in England and won a middleweight championship there before coming to the United States in 1867. 1869, he won the heavyweight boxing championship of America and won the heavyweight boxing championship of England in 1870. 1873, he defeated Mike McCool to become heavyweight boxing champion of the world, and he defended his crown until he lost to Joe Goss in 1876. Yep, he even says so on his stone. <laughs> this has got to be a brand new stone. Maybe it was purchased by his descendants, but if there's a way I can find the information, I'll definitely put it on the screen. But rest in peace, Mr. Tom Allen, who passed away at the age of 62 here in St. Louis. And buried right at the northwestern, actually I shouldn't say northwestern, the western part of the cemetery. That over there across the road is Calvary Cemetery. And then this is Calvary Road, which once carried City 66, Route 66 that is. But interred right here is Priscilla Baltimore. 
and I talked about her in a, in a previous episode about Brooklyn, Illinois, and she was the founder of Brooklyn, Illinois. Well, back then it was called Freedom Village, but she lived from 1801 to 1882, and then she was born into slavery. Mrs. Baltimore bought not only her own freedom, but also the freedom of her mother and her husband. She was a Methodist preacher. She later led 11 families across the Mississippi River from St. Louis and again founded Freedom Village, which is now Brooklyn, Illinois. It is the oldest black incorporated town in America. She also helped orphan kids, or adopted orphan kids, I'm sorry, and she helped found two African-American Episcopal churches, or AME churches, one in St. Louis, the St. Paul's, and the other one in Quinn Chapel in Brooklyn, which I was at. Now, her degree of involvement in this is not really known, but she was a very active abolitionist at the time. So, after the end of the U.S. Civil War in 1865, Miss Baltimore was active in social and religious organizations, helping freed slaves coming north. Now, the town of Brooklyn incorporated in 1873, and again, it was the first majority black community to do so here in the United States. But she died in 1882. There were two articles written about her in the St. Louis Daily Globe Democrat, which at the time was a lot of unusual amount of coverage for a black woman at the time. And this grave was unmarked until 2008. This headstone was put here in 2010, put up by the Brooklyn Historical Society. So, I mean, I definitely think it is a wonderful tribute. I'm gonna get up closer here. And I hope Mother Baltimore continues to rest in peace and rest in power. And like I said, there are several interesting stories related to a lot of the people who are buried here, be it, you know, they could be somebody's personal relatives, ancestors, whatever, historical figures. And this one is not really widely known here in St. Louis, but she is stop number three on the trail. I mean, Bella Fountain Cemetery officials highly recommend people visit her unmarked grave. And the person who I'm speaking of is Eliza Harper Haycraft. Now, it is not widely known that St. Louis once had brothels. And this was during the mid-19th century and during the Civil War. Now, she is definitely one with a very interesting story. She lived from 1820 and died at the age of 51 in 1871. So she had one of those rags to riches stories. She never learned to read or write, but somehow she was able to invest and purchase a lot of real estate and property within the city of St. Louis. And as you might expect me to say, she owned many brothels. Her nickname would be Madame Haycraft. Now her maiden name was Harper, but at age 20, she married someone with the last name Haycraft. Her main headquarters was in her house. And I did read somewhere that she welcomed those who supported either side of the war into her businesses. And of course she was controversial, which I'll get into in a second. But what made her very beloved locally was how she gave her wealth away. She donated many of her riches to several war hospitals and victims' families, even to orphans and children. At the time of her funeral, thousands and thousands of people watched her casket go into the cemetery to right here. But she was almost denied burial here because of, well, the business she was in. The cemetery officials finally reluctantly offered her a large burial plot here, but under the condition that there will be no marker. And recently, a book was written about Madame Haycraft, but it is mostly historical fiction. A local author by the name of Diana Dempsey wrote it out, and she um, released it, I think, sometime in 2023, in the summer. But either way, it's definitely on my next to read list, and I can't wait to dive in. But I hope you get a chance to check it out as well. So, again, this is the unmarked grave of Eliza Haycraft. Stop number three. And another thing I recommend, I mean, you can go any time of the year. Obviously, I picked fall. 
it's a beautiful time of the year because so many different colors of trees and also download the bell fountain cemetery app it's free it helps you um find um people quick doesn't matter how famous they were but make sure you know their full name because a lot of times yeah i mean it won't be found in the search results but i'm going to start things off with a tragic figure stop number 20. so this is the final resting place of a woman named katherine brewington bennett she died at age 37 and she was a prominent member of the St. Louis High Society. I mean, she was a socialite. And though currently unsubstantiated, uh, it is claimed that she took arsenic daily to maintain her pale complexion. She eventually succumbed to the poison. And she wasn't the only one, sadly, that did it, that drank arsenic. I mean, back then, before, you know, women laid outside and got tans, but... Yeah, it says here she was 37 years old, but some historians actually believe she was 41 when she passed. Yep, it's got her initials carved up there and everything. Wow. Now, the statues, I can tell, have kind of faded over time, but... Yeah, see the... And then... And it looks like somebody stole, or maybe this fell off. One of those. Oh, wow, look at this. I mean, 1855 was when she passed away. And this was, again, like a few years after the cemetery was established. So, I mean, this cemetery was brand new. This cemetery, by the way, as I noted in my last video, has been around for more than 160 years. Or actually, 170 years, so... Here's the final resting place of Charles Balmer, lived from 1817 to 1892. He was originally from Göttingen, Germany, but he immigrated here to the United States. And uh, his original name, it says here, was Henry Werner. But as soon as he uh, settled here in St. Louis, he opened a music store with his brother-in-law. He served as the organist at Christ Church in St. Louis for 46 years. And then he was also a prolific composer and music publisher. But most notably, he was chosen to conduct the music for Abraham Lincoln's funeral in Springfield, Illinois in 1865. And this is a really nice grave. I mean, just look at this up here. I mean, yeah, despite that mark up there, but... Wow. I mean, I'd say it's very nice for what it is. Of course, his wife is also buried here as well, Teresa Weber, who is also from Germany. Here are the graves of the parents of movie actor, horror movie actor, Vincent Price. To the left, is Vincent Leonard Price Sr. It doesn't say senior on there, but he lived from 1871 to 1948. To the right is Margaret Price. And that is Harriet Cobb Oliver. But if you're if you're wanting to find where the late horror movie actor Vincent Price is buried, you will not have any luck because he was cremated and his ashes were scared, scattered at sea. But Price did grow up here in St. Louis before hitting Hollywood in the big time. And his father came to St. Louis from a Chicago suburb in 1902 to co-found the National Candy Company. He would then go on to become a national leader in the confectionery and corn syrup industries. And he was also a local civic leader who was active in his work with the Boy Scouts and the Chamber of Commerce. And that factory still stands in downtown St. Louis. Now, two of my fair YouTubers, well, they're actually, um, you know, a couple, but um, they um, go by the Grim Life Collective, and they've actually been at this site because they did a video on Vincent Price. But I thought I'd come check out this grave site as well. So rest in peace to the parents of Vincent Price. Okay.
Here is the final resting place of Philip Ball. So who was Philip Ball? Okay, so Ball kind of fits him, the last name, because he was the owner of two major league franchises, both of them here in St. Louis. He was the owner of the St. Louis Terriers of the Federal League, which at one time, was, well, the Federal League was Major League Baseball's shot at doing a third uh, league in addition to the American and National League. That was only from 1914 to 1915. And then he was also the longest running owner of the St. Louis Browns. And that was from 1916 to 1933 up until his death from sepsis. But he was a wealthy guy. He was originally from Keokuk, Iowa. And he made his dealings, like his uh, fortune from the being owner of the Federal Cold Storage Company, refrigeration company here in St. Louis. But he also expanded his holdings to include ranch lands, urban real estate, oil wells, that kind of thing. And this is him and then his wife as well. She passed away in 1946. And now here's the final resting place of Charles Weimar, or Weimar. He also went by the name Carl, but he was an artist. He only lived for 34 years, but his paintings still remain in notable Missouri places, including the old courthouse downtown, which is part of the Gateway Arch National Memorial. But he was a native German, and he was part of the first wave of mass German immigration to St. Louis during the 1830s. And then he joined a generation of artists slash explorers. And then he went ahead and painted depictions of the life and the landscape of the Missouri River frontier. And of course his paintings got a lot of attention. And like I said, I mean, his legacy still lives on even like a hundred, like a century and a half years after his death. His first major painting was the abduction of Daniel Boone's daughter by the Indians which was um, painted around 1855 and 1856. And that exemplified Weimar's, or Weimar's fascination with Germanic frontier subjects with a terrified Jemima Boone kneeling in her canoe praying for mercy. Rest in peace, Charles Weimar. All right, now we are approaching the grave of Samuel Hawken. And for those who are following the tour, it's at number 36. But this one actually has some um, historical inscription on it. Samuel Hawken, born October 26, 1792, and died May 9th, 1884. He lived quite a long life. Memorial and tribute to Samuel Hawken and his brother Jacob Hawken, who lived from 1786 to 1849. They were both makers of the famous Hawken Rocky Mountain and Plains rifle, which for nearly half a century preceding the Civil War, was the outstanding choice of the old mountain men, trappers, and fur traders. General William Ashley, the famous scout Kit Carson, and Buffalo Bill Cody were among the many of these men who would have no other make if it was possible to get a Hawken. Dedicated to his memory with love by his grandsons, Frank S. Hawkins Sr. and Otis R. Hawkins Jr. Very nice. I'm kind of curious as to what it says down here. Oh, okay endowed by Bell Fountain Cemetery. Now in Webster Groves, one of the most historic places in the St. Louis suburb is the Hawken House. And I've actually been in there once, but it was for a private event, but definitely check it out in your spare time if, if you have any more time in the area. And now we are approaching the plot. It looks like a family plot of William F. Niedring House. William's brother Frederick is buried elsewhere in the cemetery, but I thought I'd mostly focus on this guy. But if you're not from the community of Grand City, Illinois, you probably do not know who this guy is or was. He, him and his brother founded the community of Grand City, Illinois, which to this day is the largest city in Madison County, Illinois. While it, I mean, it has lost population over the years, but either way, it is still number one over Alton and Edwardsville. But basically what him and his brother Frederick did was they came to St. Louis from Germany where their father had trained them to be tinners and glazers, or glaziers, sorry. With the thousand dollars, 
they began their own company making handmade kitchen utensils and then a few years later they began experimenting with stamping them out of sheet metal and what they wanted to do was they wanted to make them not just the average but they wanted to make them more affordable and durable and capture the public's favor and you know without the need of welding <laughs> but by the end of the civil war they were one of only two companies in the country using this process business grew and i mean several immigrants came from overseas many of them bringing their native languages with them from their home countries and all over europe and some of those churches still exist today like a lot of different neighborhoods from all over but Grand City is a very historic place and of course today is known as the steel mill but here is William's final resting place and you can kind of tell it's sunk in just a little bit the Niedring house and I'm sure you're familiar with Niedring house Avenue yeah there's definitely a lot of Niedring houses buried here wow look at this But their St. Louis Stamping Company would change the name to NESCO, short for National Enameling and Stamping Company. And in 1927, one part of the company, Grand City Steel, was split off, becoming its own entity. And Grand City Steel is pretty much the heart of the city. And, you know, its history is very complicated because, yes, there have been times where it's shut down. I mean, obviously, I mean, there's been a lot of controversy over you know u.s steel versus you know chinese steel who's cheaper and whatnot but either way i think the Niedring house brothers you know they deserve a lot of credit because they helped create a middle class and they help people get back to work here is the final resting place of alexander skinker which is part of uh looks to be a family plot but Alexander Skinker was a 1905 graduate of Washington University in St. Louis, and he enlisted in Battery A, St. Louis Light Artillery of the Missouri National Guard. He was serving in France with Company 1, 138th Infantry Regiment, a federalized Missouri National Guard company under the 35th Division, when he was killed in action on September 26, 1918 at Chepy, France. On the day of his death, he led an attack on enemy machine gun positions, seizing ammunition and feeding an automatic rifle until he was killed. His conspicuous gallantry earned him the Medal of Honor. The veteran is interred right here. And for those wondering, yes, Skinker Boulevard in St. Louis is named in honor of this hero. Let's see what it says here. Pretty much probably the same. It says here, Argonne. Oh, Battle of the Argonne. He was 35 years old and who was again awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty. And this right here where that mark is, this is where his final resting place is, 1883 to 1918. And just within a walking distance not even like a few steps away is another interesting person and this is an unmarked grave but the cemetery included this as part of their white line trail but this is the final resting place of Blanche Shea she was a stage actress and unfortunately her life took a very very tragic end literally you know as she was on stage and this happened at a theater called Ludlow and Smith Theater here in St. Louis. I do not know where it was or what it, where, what it is now, but what happened was she was performing the character of Mrs. Wood in the play called Jack Shepard. And she was going to go on stage and make an entrance, but she was struck on the head by a weight falling from a frayed rope. She was killed instantly. Life 
I mean, just didn't give her a chance that day. But, and I don't know the story about why she does not have a grave, but cemetery officials say she was buried here. So I'll pay a tribute to her. I hope she rests in peace. Here is the final resting place of Samuel and Susan McGoffin. So about Susan, this is mostly about her, I'm sorry to say, but um, I'll tell you more about them too. But Susan was the granddaughter of Revolutionary War hero and first governor of Kentucky, Isaac Shelby. Susan Shelby married Santa Fe trader Samuel McGoffin. Together they became wealthy from the trade and traveled across the United States to their stores in Mexico. She is best known for the journal she kept during a caravan trip from Independence, Missouri along the Santa Fe Trail. Lived from 1828 to 1855. And her husband Samuel lived to be at least 87 because it says 1801-1888. But both of them rest in peace. So as I'm at the time I'm doing this video my most popular video as far as views and maybe likes, it's got close to 7,000 views, is the Max Feuerbacher Mansion. And for the first time ever, I'm visiting his grave, which is right here. And to this day, I'm still kind of wondering, you know, about the whole curiosities of the mansion and why I got so many views. I mean, either way, I'm grateful. But I think one of the reasons why is because you know it's very mysterious and I'm pretty sure I don't know if it's got new owners yet but the, the mansion I'm talking about is just a block or two away from the Anheuser-Busch brewery in uh, Sular neighborhood it's not too far from Big Daddy's but speaking of Big Daddy's um, the mansion or I'm sorry the brewery that he owned once sat there but let me tell you a little bit about Max Feuerbacher so he immigrated here from Germany and he wanted to follow in his dad's footsteps in the brew brewing trade and he eventually owned the Green Tea Brewing Company. He served as an apprenticeship in the brewer trade in Germany before coming here in 1852, coming to the United States that is. But first, um, when he arrived in St. Louis, he found employment at the Eurigs Brewery and later at the Philadelphia Brewery. He became a partner in the brewery of Joseph J. Schneider and Company. They built a new brewery on 8th Street using caves under the building to store beer. After purchasing Schneider's part of the business in 1885, the company became known as the Green, Green Tree Brewery, with Feuerbacher becoming the president of the company. Now, 10 years before Feuerbacher's death, his famous mansion, or his locally famous mansion, was built. It became known as the Lion House. It was built of red brick and the stone lions, you know, were there. And of course they're still there. The double bay windows and it's nice view of the Mississippi River if you go to the top of the building, made it famous. But today it is also known for its paranormal activity. Like they say Max actually haunts the house, but I have yet to experience that. But once it becomes open to the public, uh, I'll have to figure that out, but <laughs> but rest in peace, Mr. Max Feuerbacher. And now in this huge mausoleum, well, there's many along this row, but this guy is George Warren Brown, final resting place. He was the founder of the Brown Shoe Company, which he started in 1875. Today it is known as Calaris Incorporated. And that the name change was back in 2015. It is currently being headquartered in Clayton, Missouri, as it had for a number of decades. The company had went by several different names, and at one time it was the most successful shoe company in the United States. But not without its share of challenges. Like for example, in 1939, the company went bankrupt. But Brown was very, again, successful in the shoe trade. Underneath there it says God hath given us eternal life first John 511 yeah it looks like at one time there was uh, something here and something there so I don't know if it got intentionally removed or stolen but either way rest in peace mr. Brown 
Okay, now I'm approaching the final resting place of David R. Francis. As it says right here, Governor David Rowan Francis from 1889 to 1893. Lived from 1850 to 1927. That is, this is actually not his uh, resting place. That It's a, right up there, as a matter of fact. But yes, this is uh, where all of his family, not all of them, but a lot of his family members are buried. So besides being a, he was the 27th governor of Missouri, by the way. He was also the mayor of St. Louis, and he was the United States Secretary of the Interior. He was also the U.S. Ambassador to Russia between 1916 and 1917 during the Russian Revolution of 1917. And he described himself as a Woodrow Wilsonian Democrat. Now, I did talk about Francis in a previous video two years ago. Francis Field, which of course is named after him. And it was named after him because he presided over the city have, hosting the Louisiana Purchase Exposition or the 1904 World's Fair. <laughs> but he was also president of the organizing committee for the Olympic Games, which happened that same year here in St. Louis. And he actually served on that position for 19, from 1900 to 1904. As far as his early life, he was born in 1850, October 1st, in Richmond, Kentucky. And then he graduated in Washington University here in 1870. And then right after graduating, he became a successful businessman, served as the president of the Grain Merchants Exchange. And then he was also a founding member of the St. Louis Mining and Stock Exchange. And that's where it all went uphill for him. And by the way, the president he served under was Grover Cleveland, as far as the Secretary of the Interior. And for his success in the 1904 World's Fair, he was sent to Europe by the World's Fair directors to thank kings, emperors, and other rulers for their part in making the exposition a success. He was decorated by the emperors of Germany and Austria, as well as the Queen of the Netherlands. Huh. Yeah, very interesting. He was also the final owner of the St. Louis Republic, which was an early St. Louis newspaper. It was competing with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the Globe Democrat, but yeah. <laughs> but according to his biographer, which I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna talk about more about David Francis in the next grave, where I expose kind of the dark side of him, but um, as far as his personality, he was brash, opinionated, stubborn, smart, foolish, straight-talking, independent-minded, proud, proud of his country's history, among many other things. I want to get up closer because it looks like somebody, yep, people have put money here. Wow. A dollar, two dollars, lots of coins. Okay. But once again, this is his final resting place. And this is his wife. Jane, who he married in 1876. And now here is where I'm gonna kind of expose the dark side of David Francis. Now this is the final resting place of the Hayward family. And the most notable one right here is resting Florence Hayward, who lived from 1855 to 1925. She was born in present day New Mexico but she moved to St. Louis in later years. She was a freelance writer. Her work appeared in liter literary journals, magazines, you name it. And then 1901, she became involved in the Louisiana Purchase Expedition, also known as the 1904, 1904 World's Fair, which of course was right here in St. Louis. It would be one of the biggest well-known World's Fairs. So David Francis was in charge of the World's Fair and but she was able to convince Mr. Francis that she should be part of it. And as a result, um, she was made commissioner, first woman commissioner of the exposition. So she went overseas and got some gifts from other countries, from heads of state and even from the Pope. Now, King Edward the uh, Seventh um, was able to lend his mother, Queen Victoria's Jubilee gifts to St. Louis. Um, pretty much just to improve, you know, American and Britain 
um, relations. And the gifts came in due time, and they were guard, well guarded. They were placed inside what is now known as Washington University in the library. And it was expensive jewelry. It was one of the most visited exhibits at the fair. And then she also visited the Pope and obtained an exhibit from the Vatican, you know, which came all the way here to St. Louis. When the exhibits were assembled, she was made Commissioner of History and the Jubilee and Vatican exhibits and loans from the historical features of the New Orleans Cabildo, and they were all under her supervision. She was one of the founders of the Artists Guild. Honors included her election to the French Academy in 1904 and her election to the Royal Society of Arts and the Meteorological Society of London. I mean, there's a lot of other things which, you know, a lot of titles. So Hayward was given a large salary when she was traveling abroad and uh, meeting up with heads of state across the ocean to, you know, help get involved in the 1904 World's Fair in preparation of it. Several years later, when David Francis published a history of the fair in 1913, he failed to mention Hayward's contributions as part of the fair project, and she never forgave the omission. Now, she was included in photographs of the St. Louis Fair organizers, and she was given authority to negotiate exhibits, but in the end, she received no credit than the board of lady managers, who were also sidelined. I mean, I'm not trying to, in any way, put David Francis in a bad light, but, yes, definitely, I mean, even back then, I mean, because she was, possibly because she was a woman, Florence Hayward did not get very much credit for her, you know, status and um, organizing the World's Fair, and it's very shameful to this day. But her work does appear at the Missouri Historical Society, I'm sorry, well, the Missouri Historical Museum, sorry, in Forest Park, but may Miss Hayward rest in peace. And now here is the final resting place of Don Carlos Buell, or Buell, sorry for mispronouncing it, but it, it's on the stone it says he was born near Marietta, Ohio on March 23rd, 1818, but on his final grave it also says Lowell, Ohio, but I guess it don't matter. But he died at Air Dry, Kentucky, November 19th, 1898, and he is buried here. And this is one of the places on the Civil War stop. He is buried with Miss Nanny Mason, who lived from 1838 to 1912. But he was a, he was a Civil War Union Major General. He graduated from West Point in 1841, was commissioned an infantry officer, serving in action in the Seminole and Mexican Wars. At the outbreak of the Civil War, he was assistant adjutant general and was given command of a division in the Army of Potomac in August 1861. In November of that year, he was promoted major general in command of the Army of the Ohio, seeing action in, at Shiloh, Corinth, and Perryville. Complaints were made against Buell's unwillingness to follow orders from Washington, that, which led to an investigation and that resulted in him never being offered another command and he resigned from the army in June 1864. After the Civil War, he moved to Kentucky and became president of the Green River Iron Company. And on this stone, it says here, under this stone, erected to her hallowed memory by her husband and daughter, lie the remains of, okay, Mar oh, Margaret Buell. So, it's a very nice stone. And next to Buell's memorial is General Mason. I'll tell you more about him. It's a very nice memorial, by the way. I mean, you can just tell how well sculpted it is. But General Richard Barnes Mason, Colonel of the 1st Regiment of Dragoons, U.S. Army, born in Fairfax County, Virginia, January 16, 1797, Died at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, in July 25th, 1850. This was erected by his widow and children. And a little bit more um, history about Colonel Mason was he was also the California military governor. I kid you not. Yeah, he was commissioned an officer in the first U.S. Infantry in 1817 and served in the Black Hawk War. He was promoted colonel during the Mexican-American War and served in New Mexico Territory. Following the war, he was appointed Brigadier General and the 6th Military Governor of California. 
serving from 1847 to 1849. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> very interesting what you could find about all these um, people and they're buried here in this cemetery. And this person I intentionally saved for last due to, you know, the nature and controversy. But this here, this was not here when I was here three years ago when I originally did this video because he passed away, um, I believe it was uh, summer of 2021. This guy was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom at Donald Trump's State of the Union address. He was sick with lung cancer. Okay, you probably know who I'm talking about, Rush Limbaugh, or as it says on here, Rush Hudson Limbaugh III, American Patriot, 1951 to 2021. And of course, I mean, I don't really know how to do his legacy because, you know, I do want to be fair and balanced on this channel. Let's just say if you're a conservative, if you listen to the radio, if you tuned into him every day and noon, his show is syndicated for many years, the Rush Limbaugh show. If you listen to him and agree with him, then he was a hero. But if you were liberal, left side, and uh, yeah, you you hate his guts. <laughs> Let me see what it says on the back of his uh, grave site. Okay, so radio's greatest of all time, Medal of Freedom recipient, which I just said, our country is a miracle. May we always hold true to the fundamental values of our founding and may our best days be ahead now is he radio's greatest of all time in terms of um not viewers but listeners okay maybe but uh was he well respected no not by everyone <laughs> like i said i mean yeah he did make a lot of controversial comments i mean I could go on, I mean, just check his Wikipedia page, like, yeah. And why he is buried here has always, you know, this is something I was wondering ever since, you know, when he when he first got buried here. I was like, Rush Limbaugh never did live in St. Louis. He never worked in St. Louis. I don't think he had family in St. Louis. So why is he buried here? I'm now, to be fair though, he is from Missouri. He... He, uh, he grew up in Cape Girardeau, which is about an hour and a half from here. But uh, but I am still kind of wondering as to why he is buried here. I mean, I'm not saying I don't want him to be buried here. He, I mean, this guy had millions and millions of dollars. I mean, he made millions of dollars, you know, through his radio show, among many other things. And he had all the money in the world. He could have been buried anywhere except for a military cemetery or something like that. But he chose to be buried here. So, but then I kind of dug a little deeper in information and then it was, I finally found out that he was into historical cemeteries and this was one of his favorites, supposedly. So, and there's plenty of room for more burials here at the cemetery. So, and of course a flagpole was erected there and a bench on both sides. So anybody who was a big fan of Rush Limbaugh's can chill here for a long time and talk to the ghost of their radio hero and one other thing that i'd like to add about rush limbaugh is that in the past you know i've worked at a few different places and at two different places i had bosses who claim who proclaim themselves as more centrist on the political spectrum and they admitted they did tune into Rush Limbaugh because it helped them learn more about politics besides the news. And in some ways it helped motivate them, you know, to see what's going on inside Congress and whatnot, what's going on in Washington. So maybe Rush Limbaugh was a great political source for some people is where I'm getting at. There has already been vandalism here from what I've read from the Riverfront Times, which is a St. Louis newspaper. But I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, you know, any opposing side. I mean, you're all better than that. You know, don't be damaging people's graves. I don't care who you are. All right, I am Jason. Thanks for tuning into this episode, the sequel episode to Bell Fountain Cemetery in St. Louis. If there are any graves that you want me to visit, 
Hey, just put them down in the comments and I'll check them out because like I said, there is still lots of hidden history to be uncovered among a lot of these burials here. And I'm glad I did this. So uh, let me know what you all think. All right, I'm Jason in Bella Fountain Cemetery signing off.